Thank you very much. And to all of you who have come to this very important occasion, I am deeply honored to be invited as the speaker for the inauguration of Dr. Marvin McNichol as the president of Colgate Rochester Crozer Divinity School. Let me tell you why. First, there are several former students of mine teaching on the faculty here. <laughs> Professor James Evans and Gay Browen. Professor Evans is a major interpreter of theology in the African American community, and his books have helped to shape the development of black liberation theology. And Dr. Brian, Brian is a New Testament scholar and early, of early Christianity who recently gave a deeply moving interpretation of my latest book, The Cross and the Lynching Tree at Union Seminary. Second, Colgate was also the first theological school to invite me to lecture when I was searching for my theological voice more than four decades ago. I was trying to do something new in theology that no professional systematic theologian had done or even attempted before. Namely, to interpret the meaning of the Christian gospel in the social and the political context of black people's struggle for justice, especially as defined by the black power revolution. It was the spring of 1968. Malcolm X was dead and frustrated Young black students were shouting black power in the streets of the urban ghettos, trying to find meaning in a society that had rejected them. Martin Luther King Jr. had made his uncompromising stand against America's war in Vietnam as he was planning a poor people's campaign in Washington, D.C., and also marching for sanitation workers in Memphis, Tennessee. White churches were in a state of confusion as their ministers challenged King's foreign policy credentials and vehemently opposed black power as reverse racism and unchristian. In the midst of this crisis, 1968 at Colgate, I addressed the topic Christianity and Black Power. Three years out of seminary, only 29, I was a little unsure of myself intellectually but very confident about one thing. The God of the Hebrew and Christian scriptures is best understood as the liberator of the poor and the oppressed, the downtrodden and the despised. That biblical truth was very clear in the story of the Exodus, the message of the prophets, and especially in the life, teachings, and death of Jesus of Nazareth. One doesn't have to be a theological genius to know that biblical truth. With no formal education, black slaves grasped that truth and expressed it in a song, Oh freedom, oh freedom, 
Oh, freedom, I love thee. And before I be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. This message of liberation also defined the history and preaching of black churches, which lit the fire that gave birth to the civil rights movement in the 1950s and 60s. Black power deepened the theme of liberation by telling black people that their blackness is nothing to be ashamed of, but rather is God's creative gift and thus should be embraced. The phrases black is beautiful baby burst forth from the lips of young blacks and old as James Brown sang, I'm black and I'm proud and Aretha Franklin demanded respect. We were living in a time of the resurgence of blackness, black pride, a time of the resurrection of dead Negroes, transforming them into proud black people. For me, the rise of blackness in the civil rights movement was a revelation of God's liberating spirit in the life of black people that America had enslaved, lynched, segregated, and despised for more than three centuries. That was why I said in that lecture that black power is not an antithesis of the Christian gospel. It is Christ's central message in 20th century America. It is God's liberated spirit empowering black people to say free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. That was what black power meant. My lecture was the seed of my first book, which I told the faculty of Colgate at the time that I was going to write during the summer. They invited me back in the fall as a theological fellow to present four lectures from the book that I was going to write. <laughs> that invitation was both a great challenge and an affirmation of confidence in me as a promising young black theologian. And shortly after my appearance at Colgate, Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated April 4, 1968. That event shook me to the core of my being, as it did with most Americans, especially blacks. It was fuel. It, it also fueled my passion to bear witness to the liberating power of the gospel in America's racial crisis. Although black people were being shot down in the streets all over America, as they fought for justice that should have been theirs at birth, white theologians said virtually nothing about the black revolution that would even soon shut down Colgate Rochester Crozer for several days. They were, these theologians, white ones, were still talking about Bootman and Bart the death of God and the quest of the historical Jesus, the theology of hope, which was the newest thing coming out of Germany at the time, the land that gave us Nazism and the genocide of six million Jews. They seemed not to notice that America's cities were burning and Christian churches urgently needed a prophetic word from God that would inspire Christians to take a stand for what was right and just in America's racial crisis. During the first week of June, I sat down to write a prophetic word for America's racial crisis with so much rage and anger 
I could hardly hold my pen in hand. I had to write what I was feeling and thinking about Jesus and the black struggle or be destroyed by the rage that was inside me. As Jesus said in the Gospel of Thomas, if you bring forth what is within you, what you bring forth will save you. If you do not bring forth what is within you, what you do not bring forth will destroy you. I was searching for the meaning of salvation in the days of destruction. Five weeks after I sat down to write, I brought forth black theology and black power. Born out of black people's struggle against white supremacy, as defined by the ministries of Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X, the civil rights and black power movements. I returned to Colgate with fire in my belly, ready to talk about the gospel with all the passion in my being. Colgate was my first theological platform, the first audience who witnessed the birth of black liberation theology. For me, the writing of black theology and black power was, as the prophet Jeremiah said, something like a burning fire shut up in my bones. Weary of holding it in during my seminary days, I could hold it in no longer. Words I could not keep to myself. To speak about black liberation theology in 1968 before an enthusiastic audience for four days was a great liberating moment for me, lifting me to an intellectual realm of experience and reinforcing my vocation to be a theologian of the Christian church. That was why I expressed my gratitude for their invitation to me, to the faculty, in the preface to Black Theology and Black Power. And 43 years later, I am here tonight to thank you once more. Third, that you have selected one of my students first, one of my first and one of my best students as your president merely deepens my respect for you. I truly believe that you have made a wise choice, not because he was one of my students, but because in ministry and in scholarship, Dr. Marvin McMichael embodies much of what I've been saying about the gospel of Jesus Christ for four decades. I have watched him from afar and close up and have the deepest respect for him as a person, a minister, scholar, and administrator. But most important, he's a Christian, a follower of the man from Nazareth, not just in name, but in life. When I heard that Marvin, as I know him, had been selected as the president of Colgate, I said to myself, some people really know what a seminary is supposed to be about. <laughs> For we are living in challenging times, so-called post-racial times. In the age of the Tea Party, the Mitt Romney and Barack Obama debates, Joe Biden and Paul Ryan, a time when meaningful choices seem elusive. And in these confusing times with loud voices from the right and the left, Christian churches need courageous 
and intelligent leaders who are committed to the gospel of Jesus and not to dead religious institutions. We need prophetic voices who are not able to, who are not afraid to speak the truth about race, war, violence, poverty, same-sex marriage, immigration, and a host of other issues that divide our nation and our religious communities. What is God's liberating and reconciling word for our troubled times? This is the question, the theological challenge for divinity schools and seminaries today. It took me a long time for me to find my theological voice to discover what the gospel demanded of me as a Christian theologian. I left Arkansas in 1958 for Garrett Theological Seminary and put, completed my doctorate in systematic theology at Northwestern University in 1965. I read Bart, Budman, Tillich, and Niebuhr, and every other European and American theologian of that time. But I didn't find my voice reading them. I wrote a dissertation on Karl Barth that is not worth very much, but it was an intellectual and theological journey I had to travel before I could find my own way in theology. No one can find his or her voice in 20th century Protestant theology without wrestling with Karl Barth. One must wrestle with the great masters in theology those intellectual giants who define the discipline before you came on the scene, you must not ignore them. You have to struggle with them and fight with them before you can carve out a space to speak your own word of truth. After I graduated, I wrote an essay called Karl Barth and Ludwig Feuerbach in an effort to establish myself as a scholar. I wanted to be a scholar like my teachers so I could prove that I was worthy of the education that I had received. But my heart wasn't in it. Who cares about Bard and Feuerbach when blacks were being shot down in the streets? Then I wrote an essay on the death of God theology and one of whom taught at Colgate, the late William Hamilton. Again, that made no sense, especially since America's churches had far more urgent issues facing them. That was trying to write those papers was nothing but a form of theological self-hate. Because as James Baldwin says, one writes out of one thing only, one's own experience. Thank God, I finally came to my senses and realized that my theological priorities were misplaced. Here I was with a PhD in systematic theology. And like the white theologians who taught me, I was saying nothing about black people's fight for dignity in America. I have always known, however, that Christianity and white supremacy could not be reconciled. Even as a child in Arkansas, I knew that. I also knew it in seminary. But I did not know how to engage the contradiction in theology because the way theology was defined left no place for talk about white supremacy. I was so frustrated that I once called my doctoral advisor a racist before a class of 40 students. 
And I told him that because he wasn't saying anything about white supremacy and what it posed for the Christian faith. Of course, he got very upset. Because <laughs> he took it personally. <laughs> and of course, I quickly corrected myself so I could complete my degree and get out of there. <laughs> now, after I graduated, I was determined to say what I thought about theology and white supremacy in America. There comes a time when you can tolerate the contradiction no longer. You have to speak. That was what happened to me when I wrote Black Theology and Black Power. What my professors taught me and what I read in Barr, Tillich, and Niebuhr and the other theologians I knew was not sufficient for interpreting what was happening in the black freedom struggle. For me, white theology was morally and theologically bankrupt. I could not follow any theology that ignored black people's struggle for dignity. I had to bear witness to God's solidarity in the uh, uh, I had to bear witness to God's solidarity uh, in, for the wretched of the earth, as Franz Fanon put it. I did not care whether my former teachers liked what I was saying. I already had my PhD. <laughs> and I didn't need their approval anymore. I didn't care what black churches and white churches, whether they liked what I was saying or not, I had to speak the gospel of Jesus Christ as I understood it. So, writing Black Theology and Black Power was my Damascus Road experience, a turning point, a radical paradigm shift in my thinking. It was both a spiritual and an intellectual conversion transforming completely my whole way of thinking about theology and the gospel. The cross and the lynching tree is the combination of my theological journey. It is my favorite book. And I thought until recently that it would be my last. But I'm not so sure about that now since I have been teaching and rereading James Baldwin, a great literary figure, and I would also add a first-rate theologian, even though James Baldwin, in an address before the World Council of Churches, replacing the martyred Martin Luther King, Jr., said in the very opening sentence, I am not a theologian in any way whatsoever, unquote. Great prophets and theologians often deny their vocational calling. I am not a prophet and not a prophet's son, Amos said to Amaziah, even though he was one of the greatest prophets in the Hebrew Bible. Reinhold Niebuhr repeatedly said that he was not a theologian, even though he was one of the greatest theologians in American history. Although Baldwin never went to seminary and left the ministry after three years at the age of 17, yet I contend that theologians and churches can learn a lot about the Christian faith reading him. Baldwin's writings and interviews are filled with theological insights about the meaning of the Christian faith in troubled times. He often said he left the pulpit to preach the gospel. The boy preacher had to leave the church to save his soul. Baldwin was God's witness. 
God's revolutionary black mouth, to use the poet Amir Baraka's apt description of him. His critique of white and black churches was defined by his righteous anger and derived from his deep love for humanity. In order to become a moral human being, Baldwin said, in a language similar to Jesus's, I have to hang out with the publicans and the sinners, the whores and the junkies, and stay out of the temple where they have told us nothing but lies anyway, unquote. Baldwin was unrelenting in his critique of black churches, describing them as a mask of self-hatred and despair. The problem with black churches, he says, is the same as with white churches, hypocrisy. They did not live the message that they preached. The transforming power of the Holy Ghost ended when the service ended and salvation stopped at the church door. When we were told to love everybody, Baldwin said, I thought that meant everybody. But no, it applied only to those who believed as we did, and it did not apply to white people at all, unquote. Baldwin could not accept that. What was the point, he said, what was the purpose of my salvation if it did not permit me to behave with love toward others, no matter how they behave toward me, unquote. Now that sounds like Martin Luther King Jr., whom Baldwin admired and supported. Baldwin did not believe that he could be truly a moral human being unless he divorced himself from all the prohibitions, crimes, and hypocrisies of the Christian church. If the concept of God has any validity or use, he said, it can only make us larger, freer, and more loving if God cannot do this, then it is time that we got rid of God, unquote. Baldwin did not abandon the gospel. He merely left organized religion, the, inst the institution that justified slavery, segregation, and today even defends homophobia. That was why Baldwin said the church is the worst place to learn about Christianity. Malcolm X said the same thing to the students and faculty at Colgate only a few days before he was assassinated, February 21, 1965. Martin, Malcolm, and Jimmy are my intellectual and spiritual trinity. They helped me to write and talk about the Christian gospel with clarity and with power. Reading and listening to them is like receiving revelatory insights from unexpected places. Malcolm keeps me black, Martin keeps me Christian, and Jimmy keeps me writing. He is the artistic spirit that holds my black and Christian identities together and shows me how to express what they mean in a new and creative way. And when students at Union come into my theology classes, I do not try to convince them to think about the gospel the way I do. That is not my task as a teacher. I try to teach them how to think and not what to think. 
that is, how to find their theological voice. I tell them how Slymarker, Harnack, Bart, Tillich, and Niebuhr found their theological voices. I show them how I and other liberation theologians like Rosemary Ruther and Gustavo Gutierrez found their theological voices. But Bart's voice or my voice is not their voice. Other theologians in the Christian tradition can help you to find your voice, but they cannot be a substitute, a replacement of your own responsibility to speak your own theological truth as you read the signs of the time. I tell my students, that they should learn from Bart and from Gutierrez, but don't try to become either. Become yourself. Find your own theological voice so you can speak and write with the self-confidence of what someone called to the ministry. No theological tradition or theologian can replace your own independent thinking about the gospel. We are called to love God with our heart, soul, and mind. Don't forget about the mind, which is a gift from God for reflection. Doing theology is loving God with your mind. The task of divinity schools and seminaries is to teach their students about the importance of the intellectual love of God. It is a deeply spiritual experience to think about God in a disciplined and creative way. The primary goal of seminaries, therefore, in divinity schools is to help students to develop their minds so they can find their intellectual voice in ministry and not simply mimic the sermons and the theologies of others. They should show students how to think clearly, critically, and independently about the gospel so they can stand up for justice and truth in time of crisis. An unexamined faith is not worth living because it will fail you just when you need it most. There is something profoundly liberated about coming to voice, about coming out of the closet, as queer theologians put it. I have learned a great deal from many theologians, especially from Martin, Malcolm, and Jimmy. But I still must think for myself, Jesus of Nazareth, the one who was lynched at Calvary, is my final authority, about whom Peter said they put him to death by hanging him on a tree. This paradox of a crucified Savior lies at the heart of the Christian story. This paradox was particularly evident in the first century when the crucifixion was recognized as the particular form of execution reserved by the Roman Empire for insurrectionists and rebels. It was a public spectacle accompanied by torture and shame. One of the most humiliating and painful deaths ever devised by human beings. That Jesus should die this way required a special theological explanation. It made no rational or even spiritual sense to say that hope comes out of a place called Golgotha. 
the place of the skull. For the Jews of Jesus' time, the punishment of crucifixion was held a special shame. Given their belief that anyone who hung on a tree was under God's curse. Thus, that's why Paul said the word of the cross is foolishness to the intellect and a stumbling block to establish religion. The cross is a paradoxical religious symbol because it inverts the world's value system with the good news that hope comes by way of defeat, that suffering and death do not have the last word, that the last shall be first and the first last. Seminaries and divinity schools are called to teach this message of the cross, which is intellectually absurd. Can intellectuals teach an absurd message? A message that is foolishness to their minds? Some theologians say no. And I understand that, but I say yes. This is the challenge as professors and theologians. Our challenge is to teach the cross without glorifying it, without glorifying the suffering of the poor. The poor have suffered enough. They do not need ministers and theologians justifying their poverty. What the poor need, what the poor need to know, as we say in the black church, is that in Jesus we have a friend, a companion, who will talk with you and walk with you through the storms of life. In Jesus we have a co-sufferer. He's a heart fixer and a mind regulator, a way maker and a wheel in the middle of a wheel. Someone that you can count on to be with you and fight for you when the going gets tough in trials and tribulations. The poor need to know that their poverty is not the last word about their humanity. They have a new future, not made with human hands. So in the midst of tribulation, of segregation, and the terror of lynching, and now the new Jim Crow, despite the centuries of extreme suffering, black people, Refuse to lose hope. Refuse to give up in despair because as Baldwin says, despair is sin. We know that no matter what absurd suffering we encounter, or how long we encounter it, we will not be destroyed by suffering. For we believe that we will understand it better by and by. In the words of Charles Tinley, trials dark on every hand, and we cannot understand all the ways that God would lead us to the promised land. But God guides us with God's eye, and we'll follow till we die for we'll understand it better by and by, by and by when the morning comes and all the saints are gathered home. We'll tell the story of how we overcome and we'll understand it better by and by. Thank you.